This was then and, and was the last time I saw it, a very small community, mostly with people living near the Salina. Now, for people who don't know where the Salina is, it's a body of water between the main island and a key that goes out with the tide and leaves a beach that can be walked on like a road. And then in the later part of the day, it would, the water would come in again, and that's where we would go with Dady to, to fish, because we could hold the ends of the net <laughs> while he, he knew where to, to pull it around to catch the shads that we'd have for our meal. Wow. My mother uh, was always a home person. Um, she sewed mostly for the boys, and she also did a little farming, and she did some gardening when we moved to Deadman's Key, particularly of peanuts, which we thoroughly enjoyed because you can always reap peanuts and leave the tree intact. Peanuts used to grow in Long Island? Well, if you planted them, they would grow. Wow. They, you don't, you don't, nothing grows unless you plant it, yeah, or that. the birds drop it for you. I, I never knew we grew peanuts in the Bahamas. Really? This is my historical lesson for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we used to do was to, we, we decided how far from the main plant the peanuts would be, because you know they went out on tendrils. And you can take off the soil, eat the young peanuts, and then cover it all over again. And Mama knew when we did it, but she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know she knew when you did it. <laughs> 14 children? Yes. I'll start with the oldest. I am. Oh, okay. Yeah. You want me to go down the list? Yes. All right. Well, I don't remember the name of the one who died, but we are 13 now. Okay. Ivy, Sheila, Cora, Giran, Robert, Anna, Gretchen, Ida, Chester, Berkeley, Dudley, Nita, and Kenneth. <coughs> so that was a recitation you learned. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because when when Mama was calling somebody, she would say, Ivy, Sheila, Cora, Giran, you know which one I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we lived in, in Roses until I was about eight. So I don't know a lot about the details of what they did, except they were all farmers or fishermen. But I could re I recall our front room being the post office. It was when the when the boat would come in, the all the goods would come through our settlement because my uncle was, I think, I don't know what you would have called him, but he was the one who sought to get the stuff off the boat. Okay. And so Dady was the postmaster as well as the teacher, and we met quite a few people that way. But I was always more intent on interfering with Mama's sewing things, so I didn't bother too much with what else was going on, like the farming and, and, and the gardening. Um, my sisters and brothers banned me from the garden. <laughs> I think you might have read that. I started, but I would get up early and check my own to see if any new roots had grown during the night. So they thought that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have been the neighbors? Who um, close to you? In Roses, we lived next door to my grandparents. We called them Ma and Pa. They would have been Walter. She, he was a Darville. My grandmother was a Watson. Okay. And my uncle, Wendy, and his family lived the nearest on the other. Now, when I say next door, I don't mean next door like we know in Nassau. It meant that you had to walk some distance to get there. <laughs> to reach the next door. Yeah. And then on the main road, going out to <laughs> the street, but we had several paths. But the main road was, um, I suppose they call that the Queen's Highway. <laughs> Theoretically, it was a Twain's Highway, but these small roads would lead to the pastures, um, to the farms, you perhaps mean, to the mean church. These paved roads? roads no, no, paved. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by paved? With asphalt? Well, there were spots that were paved, but they didn't last long because the rain would wash that little bit of tar off in no time at all. Um, it was really a, a big a wide track road, okay. as far as I can recall. Okay. Um, perhaps I can tell you when we were moving to Deadman's Ski, from Roses to Deadman's Ski took us all day. I read that in your book. Yeah. A full day journey. Oh yeah, we were on a truck too, we weren't walking. 
And there were only three trucks in Long Island at the That's time. That's right. Mr. Earl Wells had a truck. He lived in Edmunds Key. And so the Board of Education, there was no such thing as a ministry then. There was a Board of Education, rented the truck to transfer my family from Roses to Edmunds Key. And it took us all day. I mean, by the time we got to Clarence Down, we had ridden for half a day. And I think the whole distance was about 50 miles. Oh, I was I was told later that it was 50 miles. <laughs> you can imagine 50 miles in a day. It tells you the <laughs> condition of the road uh, back then. And, and, and the fact that he took pride in his truck. Yes. Because, oh, but I should add, too, that it wasn't all travel in the sense of being driven. Okay. So we had, he had to stop to allow the children to jump off the truck, to open the gates that crossed the street, the road, the main road. What gates crossed the main road back then? These were gates to people's pastures. I mean, you needed to keep your sheep separate from the other people's sheep. So I don't recall how many gates there were, but I know we got off the truck more than once to open the gates, and then we had to wait until the truck passed through, then we'd close the gate. So you could continue on your journey? Uh-huh. So you would have started school with Daddy as your headmaster? Yeah, well, we went to school, I suppose, as soon as we could talk. I, 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 I'm sure Mama didn't keep us home much longer than that. Because you started we were, preschool? Yes, <laughs> we started preschool without permission of the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> and then you would have ended up moved from Roses to to Deadman's Key. Mm -hmm. Well, Deadman's Key is a much much larger settlement, even it was then than than Roses and some of the others. Uh, my dad's father had two houses in the yard, and my uncle lived in the newer one. So he was there all the time. He had married and had a family by the time we moved. And the other house was vacant, which would have been the house in, that my dad was born in. Okay. So we moved into that house because the teacher's residence was reserved for who was going to be the headmaster of that school. My dad was used peripatetically in the sense that if there was a need, say, in Grays or in back in Clarence Down or wherever, he could go for maybe a week at a time okay. and, and come home again. So we moved into what would have been his family home. Who was his father? Who was his father? His name? father was Lionel Turnquest, who was a captain, a boat captain, and his mother was Ida Blanche Taylor from Clarence Down. She was of the stock of Major Archibald Taylor, who was allegedly... Um, an officer in the American service who came over to Clarence Down after the war that the United States enjoyed to separate one part from another. And then you would have finished your schooling? At Buckley's. At Buckley's? Buckley's, Long Island, yes. Um, Mr. NGM Major was the headmaster there. The school is now named in his honor. Yes. And so... I was there from about 8 until almost 12. Who would have been some of your classmates with you oh, my dear. in school, if, if you could remember, back in at the L, LGM? I can't say that I remember classmates because there were, it was just a big open area. I mean, okay. you know, we weren't classes in the sense of being shut okay. up with a few people in a room. Um, there was the gallery, which was a big stage almost like a, a, an arena okay. where the young children sat. <clears throat> uh, school started at the age of six in those days. So from six to about eight, people would be on the gallery and they would be taught by a monitor. The rest of the building was set up with six foot desks in different arrangements. And the headmaster who sat on a dais um, <laughs> almost like a preacher overlooking this group would be the one in charge of their classes. But monitors also took groups of children outdoors to, to do various, like learning your timetables and so on, <coughs> which would have been noisy. So at about 12, 11, 10, wherever I was, um, I was a monitor and I would take some of the students outside 
to sit on the big tamarind tree log to, to read to them or have them read and so on. So you were a monitor? Oh, yeah. Okay. I was a monitor. I used to get four shillings a month. I stop talking. How, how much? <laughs> <laughs> what is that equivalent to the Mother Carrington in dollars and cents? Any idea? Two dollars and what is it? No, no, no. A dollar? Uh, a pound? A pound was 286, eh? I, I don't remember what, what it was <laughs> equivalent to. A pound was cents. <coughs> so she was getting less than a pound? Yeah. Four shillings a month? Uh-huh. Okay. Wow. And then after you would have served as a monitor, tell us about that journey. Where, where did your journey Well, continue? as a monitor, we did the um, donkey work with little children, with smaller children, because we were all little. <laughs> and then after school, after the normal hours, Mr. Major kept us to teach us our lessons because he wanted us to sit what was then called the common entrance exam. Um, that was for students who were 11 plus. It's also referred to as 11 plus exam. Okay. Which was set by the Board of Education to select students from the family islands, which were then called out islands, to come to the government high school in Nassau. Now that was the government high school you know, he emphasized the the. The. It was the only high school that the government operated. Um, there were other high schools in Nassau, but those were church schools, not government operated. Oh, yeah. So at the age of 11 plus, I took the Correct. entrance exam, was successful, and came to Nassau to go to government high school. Who did you live with in Nassau? Which boat, which boat brought you to the capital city? <laughs> I don't think it was my grandfather's boat because that was too small. <laughs> but I remember coming on a sailboat. Um, there was no mail boat okay. then. We ca came on a sailboat, and sailboats would take from four, five, seven, eight, nine, fourteen days, depending on the weather, and. Um, We'd stop quite frequently, often stop along the keys of Exuma. Okay. So I don't recall exactly how long we took to get here, but I lived with my grandmother, that's my dad's mother, and his only sister, who were resident in the fort in Castle Area at the time. That's Ida? Yeah. Ida Blanche Taylor, okay. Turnquest, yeah. Okay. In fact, people who came from Long Island all lived on Fort Finn Castle. <laughs> yeah. There, you know, there wasn't any... Mason's Edition came later, and other parts of the island grew, you know. But in, we're talking now about the 1940s, yes. you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you would have attended the D Government High School. Yes, which was situated opposite what is the British Colonial Hotel. It's called Nassau Court. Now. I don't know what it was called there. It was okay. called Nassau Court. Our school was at the end of Nassau Court. Okay. And on one side of it was the building that housed the Ministry of Works. And on the other side of it was the house of the, he was called the director of public works. I remember his name. He was Mr. Van Zalen. And um, so our school was, was right in downtown, so to speak. So I walked from Fort Finn Castle down Peck Slope by Government House and down to my high school on, um, in, in, in the area of what was then, I suppose, the government buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, who would have been some of the students you would have encountered uh, at the, this government high school? Well, I remember quite a lot of them because many became prominent later on. Yeah. Um, I think of persons such as our former Prime Minister, Pinling, mm -hmm. um, Cecil Wallace Whitfield. He was in my grade, actually. He was in my form. We, weren't, we, we were in forms, not grades. Okay. So um, there were people like uh, Dr. Farrington, I used to, people might remember Earl Farrington. Mm -hmm. um, Patsy Isaacs and Kendall Isaacs were in the top forms. I didn't speak to them, they were, they were too grown up. <laughs> <laughs> you were a little girl. <laughs> yes, I was a little girl. Um, my, the girls in my form I remember very well because I was the head of the student representative council for my form for the girls. And so I had to keep their records and make sure the homework books were put in alphabetical order on the teacher's desk in the morning. Okay. 
And so I can recall those names straight off. Oh, incidentally, we were not called by our first names. We were called by our surnames once we got to government high, yes. Yeah? So uh, yes. you were mistaken. No, no, not miss. You had no miss on anything. You got your surname called. <laughs> it was Burroughs, Butler, Carey, Coakley, Hannah, Johnson, Ramy, Rookwood, Stiles, Turnquist, and Wright. They were your forms? They were, that, those were the girls in my form. Now, um, Coakley, you might remember, know her family. They lived on Lewis Street, Sylvia Coakley. Okay. Hannah, there's Alicia Hannah. She's still, she, I think she lived on East Bay Street. Um, Hannah, Boris Bonner, Coakley. Hannah Johnson. Johnson was married to, um, she's... That Johnson was Ruth Bo Johnson's mother. Okay, Ruth Bo Davil. Ruth Bo Davil. Okay. Her name was Mildred Johnson. Okay. I'm going to give Ruth her mother's name. <laughs> Hannah Johnson, Ramming. Rami came from Fox Hill, bless her heart. I don't know how she got down to, to that school every day, but she did it. Okay. Ruby Rookwood is married to a major. Um, People might still know her. She was a, a teacher in the Adventist system, and she was a lecturer at one of the colleges in Jamaica for a while. Okay. Stiles married somebody who lived in Grand Bahama. Um, he was a member of the Senate at one point, I think. Okay. Anne Stiles. And, of course, Turnquist was next. That's, that's, uh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Wright didn't stay long. She went to the States to live. Okay. Who would have been some of the teachers you met? I think I'm gonna have. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Aideen Speggs was our principal. Okay. The two that stand out to me are Anatole Rogers. She was Miss Reeves then. And um, Cecil Bethel. We called him Uncle Cess or CB. When he wrote a note in your in your homework book, he always put CB, see me. Or we used to say see me, see me. <laughs> When he wrote, see me, see me, you got nervous because it couldn't be good. <laughs> but those were the two Bahamians at the time. I remember other teachers. We had Canadians. Okay. Um, Miss John Stone was our guide leader as well. And um, she used to give some strange instructions to us girls. And we also had... I remember one was called Miss Morris. She was a pretty young woman with gorgeous blonde hair. The boys gave her a hard, hard time. <laughs> I can remember Lionel Simonette in particular. He used to, wrote, to write notes to her when he did his, letter, his um, essays. Uh -huh. And of course, you could see her blush as she read. <laughs> <laughs> and which year would you have graduated or finished? At the I was time? there until um, 47, 48. Um, I repeated a year, and, and I was there for the Form 3. And Form 4 was when we had the typhoid outbreak. Okay. And I was one of the unfortunate ones to get typhoid, or quite a lot. Not I was no and no peculiar circumstance in being an only one. There were others from Government High as well. All did not survive. I did, but I lost all my hair, which in those days used to be beautiful long braids, and I came away with a bald head. But I, some people also lost their minds, I'm told, or, or their physical, they were physically um, affected. They had deformities. so. I'm not, I didn't get any physical deformity, but I'm not quite sure about the mind. Typhoid, that was typhoid fever? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the pandemic that hit. Uh-huh. And we were, uh, what is now called the Princess Margaret Hospital was then the um, general hospital. Mm -hmm. So, and they had a little upstairs part, it was a wooden area. And I remember asking the nurse a morning after I woke up, probably I'd, I'd been feverish for a long time. I don't recall the long, length of time they told me. But I remember her name was Nozula Seeley, and interestingly, she delivered my babies. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, I remember asking her uh, if somebody had come to the hospital in a boat I, because I had dreamt about somebody going down through the front gate 
in a boat. And she looked, just as she looked at me, I knew something was wrong. And later I found out one of our, my classmates or one of the boys had died during the night. Wow. So I was probably seeing his yes. casket rather than a, than a boat. Yes, yeah. yes. So you survived typhoid fever? I support, yeah, I survived other things too, but not nearly as bad as typhoid yeah. fever. I survived living for a while. Amen. We can talk about it when we come back. We take our first station break. You tune into Direct Talk. I'm your host, David G. Today we're talking from Roses to Mount Frith William. Joining me is Dame Ivy Dumont. Tune into Direct Talk. I'm your host, David G. For as long as we've been a country, these islands have been a favorite for royalty. And for as long as the royals have adored us as a people, we've always been hospitable and gracious hosts. From a colony to a nation, now on the cusps of its golden anniversary, these shores have celebrated royal visits with class and dignity that is wholly Bahamian. As Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth celebrates her platinum anniversary on the throne, the islands of the Bahamas welcomes the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge on this, their first visit to the country. Our coverage starts Thursday, March 24th at 4 p.m. and continues through their departure Saturday, March 26th. The ZNS Network, your home for the royal visit, William and Kate. Abuse. Domestic violence, suicidal tendencies. Are you being stressed out from these problems? Call the national hotline at 422-2763 or 322-2763. There are trained social workers available 24 hours to help you. Know that you are not alone in this. As Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth celebrates her platinum anniversary on the throne, the islands of the Bahamas welcomes the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge on this, their first visit to the country. Our coverage starts Thursday, March 24th at 4 p.m. and continues through their departure Saturday, March 26th. The ZNS Network, your home for the royal visit, William and Kate. Talk. I'm your host, David G. As we begin the second segment during the break, uh, I just booked a date with Bishop Carrington Pinder. He's coming to talk his journey on Wednesday, the 27th of April. The journey of a Sandy Point boy. Um, he said in Abaco, they couldn't travel by roads from Sandy Point <laughs> to Marsh Harbor. They had to travel by boat. It was no road from Sandy Point to Marsh Hour. You gotta talk your journey. You gotta tell your story. Um, so block off that date for us for the 27th. Uh, we'll talk about the journey of a Sandy Point boy. I'll try and confirm it for you. Yes, confirm the date for me. Um, you you were saying that when you left Long Island, Dame, that you told your daddy you was not going, going back by boat? I did. I did. I was never going to suffer that trip on a <laughs> sail on a boat again. By that time, by that time, we had mail boats, okay. we used to call them. And the mail boat smelled. I think when they put the engine in a position where it would always, the suit, the smoke would blow on the passengers. <laughs> and, and unless you could get be, below deck, which was sometimes worse, okay. you were smelling that stuff from Nassau to Long Island, from Long Island to Nassau. It was horrible, and I was sick the whole way. Yeah. Um, also, remember now that in this would have been in the 40s, uh, with the roads being what they were, the mail boat would go into Salt Pond. So I would still have the experience of traveling overland on those roads up to Deadman's Key. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't win. I couldn't win anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, as it turned out, when the airport was built, 
it was built on land, some of the land that my dad owned, okay. uh, over in what we used to call the Coco Plum, Coco Plum Pond, okay. uh, which it still is, um, Dead Muskie Airport now, and that's, that's where I went. I, I was determined I was not going to go back there, <laughs> besides boat. which I was working, and so I was able to buy a trip on the plane, and in those days you used to put on your gloves and your hat. To go on the plane? Yes. You had to dress. You couldn't you couldn't go on a plane in a what? Not looking like people look these days. It was important. You were important if you were going on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were going going to the city. Eh? Yeah. That I mean, you had to show that you'd been to the city even wow. if you were Wow. You had to put on your glove and your hat. <laughs> I love it. Oh dear. And then you would have completed government high school. Yes. Uh, what and and I was appointed a trainee school teacher. Now, one of the things that I found out, and I'm sure others since, was that when the government gave you a scholarship, which it was, as a student of government high, they expected you then, upon completion of government high, to go back to your island as a teacher. This would have been the UBP government. No, well, there was no such thing as the as UBP. Local, yeah, back then, that's right. This would have been just, just government. Yeah, remember, okay. we were a British colony. Yes. Um, so the, um, the possibility of going back to Long Island when I graduated was, was just not there. A young gentleman was already in the picture by <laughs> then. <laughs> uh, however... <clears throat> That was what was supposed to happen okay. because it was the way that they were expected to get what they would have called then trained <coughs> teachers return in the on, island. Return on the investment. Right. <coughs> and, and then later I found that Government High was really started as what was called a normal school in those days. Uh, a normal schools were train centers for training teachers. When it was started, that was the idea, but there were not enough students to make it viable. And so they had to turn it into a high school, which it continued to be up to the time that I went, and obviously since. So I got an appointment to um, what was called the Sands School. It's a building just in back of the Tribune um, offices. Um, I understand that the first headmistress was Mrs. Miss or Mrs. Sands. Um, subsequently, these schools were given designations as Eastern Prep 1 and Eastern Prep 2 and Southern Prep 1 and Southern Prep 2 and so on. And then nowadays, they're naming them again and giving them names, proper names like people. Praise okay. the Lord. And so, after you would have started teaching uh -huh. in Nassau, you would have come across this handsome gentleman named Reggie Dumont. No, no, he came across me. <laughs> <coughs> Where did you meet? At my house, interestingly. After my typhoid experience, I was in Long Island for a while, as I said. I missed a part of the year, school year. When I came back, I had to repeat Form 4. A repeat was not considered a good thing, but for me it had to happen because I'd missed too much. Yes. And um, so I did Form 4 and Form 5, and then some of the students had designs on going abroad to school. Most of us couldn't afford it anyway, but they thought about it. And so we went on to what would have been like a, great, a Form 6, but it okay. wasn't called that. It was yes. called Form 5 Removed. Okay. Form 5R. <laughs> and we stayed there for some while, but many of us who got jobs moved on, which, which of course I did. And that was... Um, would have been 48, 49, I, 48, I went to Eastern Prep 1, as it is now. Or, well, it's abandoned now, I understand it's being used as a, as a clinic. Um, my father was able to arrange for his first cousin to accept me in her home, because in the meantime, while I was ill, my grandmother uh, took her daughter, who became ill, to Long Island, which they thought, of course, she'd recuperate. She didn't. She died. But she had worked at the hospital, and straight behind the typhoid, of course, we had the tuberculosis. Okay. And she got TB. 
So Daddy hired a little house for my grandmother to take care of her and her illness. So I'm coming back to Nassau, but I had nowhere to live. Okay. So he arranged with his cousin, Edith Walker, and her husband to take me in. Now, Frank Walker was a Barbadian who was a police officer. Um, he was a corporal at the time. A corporal was a high grade at that time, I think, for local people. And um, so Uncle Frank and Aunt Edith took me in and when this young group of uh, um, police recruits came from British Guyana, as it was then, it's Guyana now, uh, <clears throat> he brought this famous one home with him saying the boy looked like he needed to have a good home-cooked meal. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm all of 16 now, and this young man told Uncle Frank on his way back to barracks that night that he was going to marry me. Um, so Uncle Frank used his, his normal Barbadian expression, stop talking down foolishness. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he did keep in touch with the family over the years. Okay. And uh, after I was off age, so to speak, 18, um, we began to become a little more in touch. And eventually, in 1951, we married. So that's the story. That's that story, except for what happened afterwards. We produced two children, and now we have four grandchildren, and we have four great-grandchildren. Where was the wedding? At St. Anne's Church in Fox Hill. Okay. And um, who performed the ceremony? Um, uh -huh. Now you've done it. I, I I used to remember his name. I don't remember, but he was a he was a priest that looked us straight in the eye when he, he had to see us together first and then he saw, or saw us individually first and then he saw us together. Father Knifton was his name okay. and he was just as sharp as his name implied. He was like a knife boring into you about the questions he asked and then he saw us together and wished us well and said he would do the wedding. Um, Who was the best man? The best man was Oh dear. I'll come back. North. Uncle Bas Basil North. Okay. And my maid of honor was Rosina Turnquest. She was Cartwright, lived in Eleuthera. She was my cousin. Where was the reception? The reception was at the house. Okay. There was, well, you know, the, those days, even if you had the money, there weren't many places you could go to have, have a reception. But we wouldn't have been able to have a reception anywhere else. So. We had our reception at the house, and of course the ladies were in the house and the men were in the backyard, which is not unusual, I think, even to the day. <laughs> and where did you go on honeymoon? Which was, we went where we were going to live. <laughs> <laughs> we went on to the upstairs apartment at the Donaldson's on Meeting Street, okay. just uh, just opposite where the pastor's um, church is, because the Donalds, Reverend Donaldson was the then the pastor of the church, and the Donaldsons lived in in a house um, diagonally opposite, and then they had a two story apartment next door. Next door, we lived upstairs. So you were paying rent. Yes. What was the What was the rent a week then back then? Let me see how good you remember. I that. no, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't know. There okay. were things that I. I didn't know for a while okay. as a married woman, or one of them would have been the rent. Yeah, husband responsible oh, for yeah. that. That's, oh, that's yeah. a good man. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And two children. What's the, what's the names of these two beautiful? My ones? children were Chetty Dean Dumont and Edda Daphne Dumont. She had a couple of other names, but she's dropped them. Okay. So I won't call them on the air. Okay. And she is now Edda Adolph. She and her family live in Maryland which is where I was uh, a couple of months ago. And Chetty? Chetty is deceased, and his wife's name is Teresa. She was a Thompson. And my grandchildren are Deidre, uh -huh. who is a public servant, and Jahan, who is a preschool teacher, uh -huh. and Chetty, who is in the building trade. Okay. And Kobe, who is 
and go, he's going to be going into his master's degree program later on this year. Great. Now, the <clears throat> great-grandchildren are so grown now, but I have to look up to the boys already, and they're, they're just sub-teens. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. And your husband? Would have passed My away. husband passed away about 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Reggie. Reggie, yeah. Everybody knew him. If he passed by you, you'll remember him. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He passed by you the first time. <laughs> See, he, he, saw, he saw at the age of 16. Love yeah. uh, he loved at first sight. Was, and he, 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 he lived uh, up to his he word. Was, he was special. Yes, yes, yeah. But you know, the um, I tell the joke that my uh, de uh, police did jail. He, if he went out with them, because we had to take away his car eventually, he insisted on driving. And he always complained, they took away my car, and so I can't go. Well, anyway, the officers would be happy to take him if he went, and he'd sit there and find out their business and advise them and whatnot. And um, then they'd say, well, Mr. Dumont, you finish that, and are you ready to go home? Are you ready to go to your next appointment? He said, I'm going home, I'm going home. I go to my house, to my wife, to my <laughs> own house, to my own wife, and my own bed. <laughs> what did he do? He was a police officer. Okay. Afterwards, he, after he retired, he worked at the Treasury for a little while. And when he retired, finally, he was, um, I think it was in charge of the Prices Control Commission. Um, okay, commission. Not the commission. Uh, he worked for the commission. Price, okay. Prices Control. Uh -huh. Okay. And then you would have, no doubt, continue on in your teaching career? Yes. In those days, it was you wake up in one school on Monday and they might send you to another school on Tuesday. So I went from Eastern Prep 1 to Eastern Prep 2, which is on Bilney Lane. Now, you might even know where that is, but that's uh, almost up to Mackey Street, uh -huh. just off Shirley Street. That was a little church building that was rented for us. And... Um, <laughs> oh, how we were treated in those days. It had no bathroom. And so the teacher, the, the principal, Miss, Miss um, we used to call her, oh dear, Miss, Miss, her sister was Grace Archer's mother. Okay. They lived next to, to, to the school building. And um, Miss Lightburn, she okay. was. We used to call her Libby. Behind her back, of course. <laughs> <laughs> she was gracious and allowed us, the teachers, to use her house. Um, the children, we had to make provision for the best we could. I'll talk about some of that later, probably in another location. And then from there, I went to the teacher's college. Now, I should mention that while I was at Eastern Rep 1, um, the government imported a couple Mr. and Mrs. Prendergast. Um, Mr. Prendergast was the inspector of schools, which meant that he had to go from school to school on New Providence, <coughs> but also he had to travel to the islands. Well, you can imagine in those days having to go by boat. He was gone quite a lot because if he had to go to Long Island, it'd take him a week to get there, <laughs> a week to go across the island, another week to, to get, get back. back. <laughs> <laughs> but Mrs. Prendergast at the time was a peripatetic teacher to tr a trainer, so she would go from school to school to teach these student teachers, I guess, what she knew, and to help us to prepare lesson plans and so on, which, of course, were necessary, but we needed to learn how to do that. Um, we used to call her Montessori because she <laughs> emphasized the Montessori <laughs> method of teaching. These are things she, I don't think she knew until we were much older. But we called her Montessori, or we called her <laughs> well, Mrs. M or something like that. Um, but she went from school to school, as I said, and we learned from her as much as she was able to teach us. And I think at the end of maybe a year or two, I can't recall exactly, but it's her experience and her husband's experience through the islands probably persuaded the powers that be that they should start a center of learning for teacher trainees rather than just having her run around the place and him as well. And that's when the teacher's college was started in 1950. Wow. <clears throat> 
Now, I was one of the first students at the Teachers College, and we were located in the buildings where C.C. Sweeting High School is now. <coughs> uh, those buildings were constructed during the war um, by the Americans for the, for the soldiers' barracks and so on. So there were quite a number of them, maybe six or more in that area, the long, narrow buildings. Some of them have been renovated. Some of them probably have been changed with additions over the years. But then they were just the barracks. And um, so we moved in in 1950 to start this Teachers, teachers college. college, which has now evolved into the University of the Bahamas, so to speak. So you would have been one of the first persons in the world. Absolutely. And um, now some of you are going to ask me about the people who were with my group. Yes. Again, I don't remember all the people, but I remember some. I had the same Sylvia Coakley who went to government high with me. She was one. Mm -hmm. um, Eula Delancey. She was a Eula Thompson. You might know her daughter, Elise Delancey. Mm -hmm. And um, she had two sons, one of whom has passed. Um, we also had Thelma Ford. Thelma used to be a Gomez. That's Bishop Gomez's sister. Okay. Um, Maria Ferguson. Maria was a tailor from Andros. And... Um, there were many others. Hubert Joaquin, who became an Out Island Commissioner and then a, a Permanent Secretary. I remember Mervyn Lim. He eventually became a banker. And many others. I, I can recall Livingston Coakley and his wife, Mary. She used to be Mary Umbrista. Um, this story is interesting. They, they met at the college, I think. Um, plan to get married, but and, you know, in those days, you just have to get permission to get married yes. if you're teaching training. And um, so, to persuade <laughs> persuade Livingston and, and Mary, I guess, to go to the family island, um, they allowed them to get married. Uh -huh. So they went to Long Island uh, as a couple. Uh, they they didn't even finish the full year of training. Uh, well, they finished more than a year, but they allowed him to go while while. Um, we with the rest of us were still in, <laughs> in school. <laughs> and you know, Livingston eventually became a Minister of Education. Minister of Education. I remember that signature signing all those BJC certificates. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Okay. So they would have been some of the... Some of the people. Now, the one that you probably hear me talk about the most is my friend Susan Wallace. I was going to get to her during the break. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know Susan, so you would know how she would behave. So, um, we, there was a little group of us chatting together, pri primarily government high school people, and uh, most of us had been in the teaching service for a little while. I'd been almost two years by then. Um, Susan and some of the others came straight from high school. She was at St. John's. I, I didn't met her. I hadn't met her before. So she walks up to this group and says, "I'm Susan Bethel. Who are you?" I'll never forget the way she did that. I looked at this little girl, <laughs> and I thought, <coughs> who does she think she is? But anyway, we became fast friends. And um, over the years, we grew very, very close. In fact, her first daughter, Jan, is my godchild. Mm -hmm. And I tell the story about how we got to move from Meeting Street up into Montrose Avenue, which everybody calls the Valley, um, Susan and Sydney had secured a house that um, Levi Gibson had built. He'd built two of them. And they had got one and they wanted us to live next to them, but somebody else had already uh, uh, spoken for this house, so they got well, it. Hold that story right there. We, okay. As we come back from the break, we can talk about Montrose Avenue <laughs> as we go to the third segment. I've got to go for the noon day news break. You turn into direct talk. I'm your host, David G. <laughs> There's a spark of greatness in each of us. That spark is called personality. Individual gifts and talents provide the fuel to set that spark ablaze. Each child has the right to an education which values their personality and nurtures their talents, while teaching them to be respectful to their parents and their cultures.
on this television station is governed by IRCA's Code of Practice for Content Regulation. The Code of Practice covers matters relating to program content that are of concern to the community, such as local content, news, current affairs and programs for children, advertising, including political advertisements and the responsibilities associated with broadcasting in the Bahamas. The code also covers aspects such as access services for the hearing and visually impaired and the procedure for lodging a complaint about anything broadcasted by this television station. The code is available on IRCA's website at www.ircabahamas.bs. To receive a copy of the code by mail or in person, you may telephone IRCA at 242-393-0234. Family Island dialing is toll-free at 242-300-8722. Or you may send a request by email to info at urkabahamas.bs. Ordinary People is back with a new season. Join us on the ZNS Network. Anybody drugs the most? Not New York's bestsellers, the hood bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Coming soon. People are only going to say yes or no. And if they say no, keep on trying until you get a yes. Ordinary people. Do you or anybody you know suffer from diabetes or a little sugar? Have you been afraid to attend a clinic or any healthcare facilities? Be assured that your health is our number one priority. Every government clinic in New Providence and the Family Islands have introduced strict COVID-19 safety guidelines and protocols to ensure your health and safety whenever you visit. If you have diabetes or any other chronic illness, it's important that you keep your regular appointments with your primary care provider to monitor your health status. Please don't miss your regular appointments. Seek medical care today. Your health is in your hands. This message is brought to you by PAHO WHO, Bahamas and Turks and Caicos Islands, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and the Healthy Bahamas Coalition. I travel all over the world and I find inspiration all around me. In the people and especially the environment. I love the Bahamas with all its natural beauty. From Abaco in the north to Inagua in the south and all the wonderful and colorful islands in between. And we must all do our part to keep the Bahamas healthy and clean now and for the future generations. That's why I want you to find a little time to do your part. I'm doing my part because I care. Do you? Headed on the road, and we want you to join us for live coverage from Bahamar on March 25th at 7 and 11 p.m. for a special edition of the Bahamas Tonight, The Royal Visit. Community page now has its own home on channel 230. Be sure to tune into this channel to see informative notices, funeral announcements, birthday greetings, and much, much more. So watch the ZNS Community Channel today on cable 230. Now you can watch the ZNS network of channels absolutely free. That's right, ZNS is now broadcasting three separate channels, free to air on Channel 13. One channel has the regular ZNS TV HD programming. One is the Parliamentary Channel, and one is the 24-7 television community page. 
These channels may be accessed simply by attaching either a rabbit ears antenna or an indoor amplified antenna to the RF input connector on the back of your digital television or flat screen TV. Once the antenna is connected, select TV mode and choose auto scan and your TV will automatically pick up channel 13 at no charge. Once you're on channel 13, just use the channel selector to go to each of the three ZNS free channels. Antennas are available on many sites online. Free TV, ZNS brings it back to you. Really, each team member must do his or her part in the race. If one member drops the baton, it impacts all of us. Across all ages, genders, abilities, nationalities, cultures, or religion, we are all on the same team. And we all have a role to play in getting to the finish line to win the race against COVID-19. Don't drop the baton on safety. Wear your mask over your mouth and nose. Keep at least three feet distance from others. Do not touch your face. And wash or sanitize your hands often. Together, we will win. Andres is the number one born fishing destination on our planet. Sports fishermen visit our flats every year to participate in one of the most fulfilling outdoor activities known to man, fly fishing. And guess what? It's 100% sustainable. Without areas like the west side of Andres, sustaining this industry would be absolutely impossible. So let's take care of nature, and nature will take care of us. Honorable Ivy Dumont. The time now, five minutes past the hour of 12. Good afternoon, Bahamas. Back to Direct Talk. I'm your host, David G. Having a history lesson for me today. I'm uh, getting to understand this place called the capital city of Nassau. Yeah, this is the second time I heard about this place called the Pond. We can talk about that when we start our conversation with <clears throat> Dame Ivy. Um, it's amazing. As I begin this second half, I want to send a shout out, a prayerful shout out to my good friend Greg Newbold Jr. Uh, who suffered a stroke in Grand Bahama sometime around the first Saturday in March. He was airlifted to Princess Margaret. <clears throat> Presently, uh, he's now stepped down out of ICU. Uh, keep, please keep remember his family in prayer, his mother, sister we know uh, at Bahamas Air, been there for many, many years, and keep the family in prayer. Mm -hmm. I want to send a birthday shout-out belated to Miss Pearl Hepburn in Freeport, Grand Bahama. Celebrated her 72nd birthday on the 14th of March. We go to Freeport Bible Church together, the best curry goat cooker in the country. <laughs> I guess for that today, I can get my curry goat shout out when I get home to Grand Bahama. Uh -huh. And uh, I got a, another shout out to another family here in the capital city of Nassau. Uh, John Wright, uh, Lucy May Wright, and Johnette Strawn, the family of Budget Store, uh, South, uh, on Soldier Road sell cars down there. Huh? I was talking to them today. Told them I'll send a shout out to them today. <clears throat> As we go into the third segment, Time Flies, Dame. Time is um, I want to remind you to join me tomorrow here. Um, celebrating Glaucoma Awareness Week is going to be the first segment. Glaucoma, the, the teeth of sight. Joining me is going to be Dr. Charlene Wallace, the ophthalmologist and Nurse Italia Gordon. And the second segment, 
we'll talk about the royal visit. I have some Mike Checkley supposed to call in from Bimini. Mm -hmm. He is uh, born in Britain, you know, so he yeah. knows about oh, the, the, the state and the royalty and the monarchy. Mm -hmm. We want to talk about as they as we get ready for the royal visit <clears throat> of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, Thursday, Prince yeah. William and Kate Middleton, uh, celebrating Her Majesty's platinum reign, 70 years. And so they are arriving on Thursday. We'll come to the capital city of Nassau, go on to Abaco and then to Grand Bahama before coming back to Nassau for the official visit. And then on Thursday, remembering the sea safe lanes in Grand Bahama, we can be talking bowling. I found uh, out uh, that the uh, Miami uh, Dumont uh, son, <coughs> Chetty, used to bowl. Not only was he a bowler, but he was a avid Table tennis? table tennis player. Her husband used to play tennis. Oh, yeah. And he believed that all of his children were supposed to have been sports enthusiasts, including her. You can imagine <laughs> the MIV up at Government House playing at the Grand of Table <laughs> of Grand of Tennis. Um, and then on Friday, I don't think there's going to be a show on Friday because of the royal visit. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to have Remembering the Life and the Legacy of the late Albus and Edwards, but we were going to change that to another date. The shows we're working on for the following week. Monday the 28th, remembering the life of the late Tony Seymour. Remember Tony Seymour? Pretty blue eyes, please come out tonight so I can tell you, baby, what I have to say. And I spoke to his son this morning, <clears throat> Tony Seymour Jr. Uh -huh. He's going to join us. Got to talk to Anwar, uh, his daughter. Um, I'm always on the phone with her. Um, and so we got to talk to, to their family about this legend. Uh, I want to talk to Gino D, Moores Island, Abaco Boy, The Journey. Uh, let's talk to some of these behemoth legends. And then um, on Tuesday the 29th, <clears throat> we're going to talk with the Cancer Treatment Center of America. They've come on board as a sponsor, okay. Miss Tina Lightburn Very and Miss Lakeisha Molly, the operations mm -hmm. manager, and Tina Tini, as we know, is the managing director. On Wednesday, I've got to confirm Dr. Peter Maynard. I want to talk about the war. Let's talk about the effect that this war between Russia and Ukraine is going to have on the Bahamas. Yeah. And so let's educate mm -hmm. the persons and so we can prepare ourselves. And then on Thursday in Freeport, Grand Bahama, we're going to talk about the first school in the city of Freeport. It was known as the Freeport School, mm -hmm. built by the Grand Bahama Port Authority, now known as St. Paul's Methodist. Mm -hmm. The Methodists would have bought the Freeport School, which was the primary segment. And the Anglicans, <clears throat> Anglican Central Education Authority, bought the high school, which was then called Freeport High School. That was the was. Uh -huh. senior school to the junior school of the Freeport School. Uh -huh. And so we're going to talk to the principal, Miss Sophia Howden. Uh, she's from a place called Duncan Town, Ragged Island. Island. They brag with that. <laughs> they say that proudly. Uh, I told her to bring along some other persons. And then in the second segment, we're going to talk about the power of social media. And then uh, the first lady, lady of education. I'm going to talk to her in Freeport, Grand Bahama. Um, got to do that show on Friday the 1st. We, we might move that to accommodate the show that we're going to lose this Friday, but we'll see. Dr. Cecil Thompson and I will confirm that. I know he's mm -hmm. tuning in today. Uh, <laughs> he couldn't wait for this interview with this notable Dame Ivy Dumont, whose yeah. journey has taken her from a place in Long Island called Roses. Uh -huh. We, we, right now, we're writing the pond. We ain't reached, we ain't reached the Mount First Billion yet. <laughs> the pond really existed, Dame Ivy. <clears throat> but that is what it was called. The, the area was called the pond. Uh -huh. That would be uh, from St. Matthew's Church going as far as almost, um, maybe up as far, I'm not too sure. May, maybe as far as Maud Street or a little beyond. Okay. Uh, but but when it rained, it literally settled so much water that it was a pond. And um, there may be a story in my book concerning that when um, on a Sunday morning I dressed to go to church and then the rain came down. I couldn't I couldn't go. And my Aunt Edith was so sure that that I should take my clothes off, which I didn't, and somebody came and picked me up, and I, I went with him to, to church. Um, but it was that bad that you couldn't go out. You, you wouldn't go out, let's put it that way. It was like when we were at the college, um, and 
<laughs> Madame Montessori would be walking about in the rain with her, her cape or her umbrella ringing the bell for us to go to classes. Well, how in the world could you go to classes if it was raining? <laughs> you were in one building, you're not going to go out to somewhere else. And then our director of education was one of our lecturers, and he had to teach people that rainy days, he says, are not holidays. That's, that's <laughs> my former principal at home. All in school used to always say, rainy days These are not holidays. Not holidays. Uh -huh. So Frank and Ingrid <clears throat> lived in the pond. Yes, they lived in, in the pond, um, and, and then we moved subsequently to um, Mackey Street, which is almost directly opposite the theater um, where, uh, where the plays are held. What is that called? Oh. Uh, uh, come back. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, some of these things run away and they don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> who would have been some of, who would have been Edith and Frank and Edith's children? Mike Noll, who died recently, Suzanne, Edgar, Gloren, uh, Paulette, and Myron. Myron died early. He was a musician. He sang along with um, Pastor Miles Monroe. They, yeah. did, did, they did a song that that is on the radio Back quite often. In the sky. No. That, 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 I can't that, sing, so that, I can't tell what it is. On the other side, eh? Yes. How, how's it go? You could like sing it. Like a cloud in the sky, I was drifting. No, there's another one. Okay. Um, Oh dear. Anyway. Someone, someone sent it to me. Younger yeah, person. somebody sent it to you. Somebody sent it to uh, me. <clears throat> yeah. So I guess their, their children would have accepted you as their big sister? I was their big sister. Okay. Actually, several of them were born after I lived with the, uh, the uh, Walkers. So they, they, they knew me as the person who kneaded and baked the bread every day and who made their sandwiches to go to school in the morning. You never needed bread. What? I promised that when I got my own house, I would never put my hand in flour again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the flesh minis rise it. Man, hush. Oh, yes. Used to have the blocks of flesh minis in those days. Nowadays, I see they got the dust thing in the paper bag, the plastic bag. You know, with the block. Yes. Used to have to pl have plenty of yeast because you had to make bread every day, literally. You know what happens when hot bread comes out of the oven? What Everybody wants to get the butter dish at the same time. Yeah. All the ends go quickly, yes, and the then heel. the middle disappears as well. <laughs> <laughs> so by the next morning, you have to figure out how you're going to get slices out of this to make sandwiches and everybody's breakfast. Oh, yeah, I know about making bread. So you know about letting the bread rise? And... <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Well, now, at home in Long Island, you used to have to um, leave, the, leave the, <laughs> some of the bread from one um, kneading, you leave that to rise so it could be the yeast for the next time you're gonna make bread. <laughs> mommy, I, when I like, mommy used to cut off the ends and, and mash it down and fry it. Uh, I just loved it when it fried. I couldn't wait see there now, see? I, didn't, I couldn't wait for it to be. <laughs> you couldn't wait. <laughs> uh, it, took too, it took too long to fry it quicker. Well, we enjoyed fresh bread regularly. Wow. Now, I confess that after I got married, and I had ch not after I got married immediately, but after I had children, I did start making bread again. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Before we went to the break, you were talking about Susan Wallace and Montrose. Yes. I was, I told you that uh, we've got to be really good friends, and Susan's mother, we used to call, all of us called her mother, and called her dad Pop. Okay. They lived in a two-story building on Fort Finn Castle. So uh, Susan's mother used to do bread, too. She made the biggest loaves you ever saw. And Susan's sandwiches when we were at the college, they were just perfect for everybody to get a little bit of it. Oh, listen, those were good days. What sandwiches? Y'all have to carry lunch money? Money for what? For like, To buy lunch. <laughs> Bye bye lunch. If you wanted to buy something, you had to send up to the base road. <laughs> you could get some. You could get some coconut tarts up to the base road, but we'd have to buy our things. There's no such thing as lunch vendors, and no, no, no. I never even. I didn't even know about that when I, when I started teaching. When we, when I taught at Eastern Prep One, every child brought lunch, and the government provided. Uh, through the Red Cross, a half a pint of milk 
that children could have if their parents agreed. Um, but other than that, there was nobody around there with food. So Susan, Susan's lunches would be prepared so that the rest of the group could sit and eat it, uh, eat with her. And then when um, she got married and I got married, she said we needed to live near each other. And so she got, she and Sydney got this house and wanted us to have the other one, and somebody else took it. So the day Jan was born, or the day after Jan was born, she called from the hospital to let me know that the house was going to be vacant. And um, she had already spoken to Mr. Gibson for us to get it for our house. So we moved from Meeting Street to Montrose Avenue, which is where our two families live next door to each other for about nine years, I guess it was, okay. seven, eight years, thereabouts. And then when they built their house in Oaksfield area on the main um, road, we built our house on Farrington Road, which is about maybe two city blocks, three city blocks apart. So we continue to be very close. But when we lived in Mont on Montrose Avenue, I don't think the children knew that they didn't belong to one another either because they were just in and out. <laughs> but Susan was an educator. Susan was an educator to the core. Ah, excellent. And she wanted always to continue learning. And so we went to Mr. Francis, Carl Francis. Um, he had a little school in his garage, and so he used to help us. And then we had, um, we were at the college together, we qualified. She went to England, and eventually I went to the States, and we all developed our teaching and learning and educational qualifications over the years. <clears throat> and then you would have come back home and paid great dividends by continuing your education, by well, continuing to develop education by teaching. Well, I taught for quite a few years. I, I became the head of that same school I first was at. Um, Mr. Francis and his wife were both teachers. And they had gone to school in, in Scotland. He was a, he's a mathematician, I think people knew that. And she was the head of that school, but she died suddenly. And I was selected to go there. At the time, I was selected to go to be the head of that primary school. I was teaching at Weston Senior with um, Ted Glover. He was the head teacher there. I'm sure his, his, his fame is well known. He was a disciplinarian par excellence, but I had the good fortune of going into what they used to call the adjunct school. As the school numbers increased, we had to hire the top floor of the Elks building, which is diagonally across the street from which was then Weston Senior. Okay. And um, four of us were in the, in that top, the top of that building, which was, um, Mr. Boleg, C.A. Boleg, he was uh, Father Boleg, who recently died, his dad. He had taught in the islands. Uh, Mr. Cooper, Gus Cooper's dad, he mm -hmm. had taught in the islands. Okay. Um, and then it was a young man who became a priest. Um, his name escapes me right now, and myself. I only had a little bit of, um, of uh, experience compared with the other gentle, the, the gentlemen, but oh, they were great teachers to me, helping me to learn as well. Uh, I had been to the college, but I hadn't had the opportunity to learn so much about the Bahamas. They were historians okay. and geographers and general educators. Yeah, yeah. So I was blessed by all kinds of education. But back to Susan. <laughs> And then Susan announced that they were going to travel, go back to her home, her home island, Grand Bahama. I thought she meant to go back for a visit, right. and then of course she went back to stay. But we stayed friends until the very end. No, until paid, the very end. We paid a fitting tribute to her uh, at a funeral. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Unfortunately, I was with my daughter in, well, I wasn't unfortunate about being with my daughter. I was with my daughter at her house, so with my two granddaughters, and I had taped that not very well at the end, I don't think I got, I, I lost it at the end. But in any event, we were listening to the, to the whole thing from Grand Bahama, and um, then I, my these two granddaughters and my daughter were saying, no, 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 what is he doing, what is he doing? 
um, you talked across the whole thing that I had to say so they didn't hear it. So they didn't like you much that day, I can tell you. Sharon, please forgive me. I was given the cue that I had to do it. And so, but I, I'm told that when they reproduced it, they were gonna take that out and just, just have the whole tribute complete. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so you can get Well, it. I wasn't vexed with you because I don't know that I wanted to hear myself again. But <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but they were, they were, they were, they were, they were upset, I no, tell no, you, no. yeah. We made, but we made peace. Until the then. end. Yeah, I think you made peace with the girls yes, afterwards. Yes. I got to watch my inheritance, you know. I, I got to make sure they don't forget me. Well, I, I'm telling you, and these are some serious girls I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, did you complete, finish teaching? Did you retire from, because I think you were, you became, in the, you went to the Ministry of Education as well. 67. Okay. Uh, my last teaching was at Oaksfield Primary School. As a matter of fact, I opened that school. It was a new new school in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and it catered to uh, the developing area of Oaksfield, which was, I would say, the developing middle class in the sense of having their own homes. Okay. And so um, I was there for a couple of years. And I was also, in a way, a part of the te teacher training system because I accepted uh, trainees to to do their teaching practice at that school. It was really near, near to the college, you know, so that was one of the things that happened there. Uh, one of my um, students, he still sends messages to me all the time, is Errol Bethel. Um, he, he was one of my early uh, student teachers there, and he was a science teacher, so he would get parts from the hospital to show the children how what a lung looked like or something. Listen, it was un unbelievable. Of course, all the teachers wanted to go in the season as well. But um, I went from there to the office as the officer in charge of primary schools. Okay. Uh -huh. And um, that was 67. And how long did you save in the office? Oh. I was in the office in one position or another until 1978, I guess it was, okay. thereabouts. Um, and then I, eventually, I eventually became Deputy Director of Education. Yes. I had a couple of stints abroad. I had I'd gone to um, the University of Miami. I had done a teacher development program, which the United States offered was six months travel grant literally traveling across the United States from Washington to Denver, Colorado, on to U University of Utah and Utah and some of the other states around that as well, out to California back. But it was done, I think there was something like 700 teachers from around the world wow. as a part of that. But gradually we moved out into smaller groups and eventually into single units and lived in homes with people. Actually, I lived in the house with a the head of a teaching te uh, b big school in, um, in Salt Lake City. Good. Had a wonderful teaching career. I had. <clears throat> I, I, I think that was, in some respects, it was probably the best part because I learned to work with children. I enjoyed that. I didn't think so at first because when I heard that I had to be a teacher, it, it wasn't a good sound. But I learned to be a teacher and I liked it. And then I had some very, very good friends as a result of it. Um, my teacher college, some of my teacher college friends became aunts and uncles to my children. Right. They, were that, they, they, they were that close. Um, and then I went from the Ministry of Education uh, as a deputy to his permanent secretary to the Ministry of Works. That was 70 some odd. Okay. And from Works? I went as a training officer to a trust company, NatWest Trust Company, NatWest. Yes. Roy West it was, NatWest, it was other names and so on. But that's where I did a lot of training as well. Um, I learned along with the students. <laughs> <laughs> but we were able to do some things that uh, um, helped others in the sense that as a result of working with Dr. Kevin Bethel, for example, at the then College of Bahamas, we were able to start the first uh, bachelor's degree program in finance at the college because my general manager was willing to assist and was willing to provide um, 
I believe, the beginning of their, their library, their financial library at, at the college. But Kevin Bethel worked with us on that, and so did uh, Mrs. Burroughs, who used to work at another bank, and Bazzi Donaldson, you might remember. Yes. He was very involved in this as well, because he was then the, at the Central Bank, as I recall. So you would have retired the first time from the public service <laughs> and the public sector. The second time, um, you would have retired from the Coots and Co. Uh -huh. uh, and then you had a third stint. Uh, what did I do after that? You got you got drafted to be some secretary <laughs> general. Um, yes, I met a gentleman who probably is the most persuasive person besides you. <laughs> um, I used to be involved in some things that had to do with, I guess, it, they were seen as political, but they weren't. The teachers union as it has become started as an association with a view to helping people who had not gone to formal high school who had grown up through the islands or through general what you call general education to get their certificates from it was then the o levels the uh, uh, um, university of Cam cambridge was when i was in school yes. and then we started the o and a levels um, and so Mr. Francis, as, as he, we saw this with him throughout his life, he always wanted to teach, and he started the Teachers' Union Evening Institute. With Carlton Francis. Carlton Francis, okay. uh-huh. Um, we, we had teachers from, from most of the schools in the islands. They did O levels and A levels there. And we realized that a lot of things were happening that shouldn't have been happening, generally speaking. And we then developed, of course, uh, from the association into a union. And I think the, 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 the calling ourselves the union was really to, to ensure that people understood that this was nothing to play with. And um, I did some little things for that, like we did some picketing and we did some uh, writing to the newspapers and all that sort of stuff. And we also ensured that the people in authority were aware that we existed and were not to be ignored. Um, and this would have been around about the 70s? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, this was before we had, before women could vote, first of all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe even before men, some oh. men could vote, <laughs> because you know they had the, um, the plural vote, yes. where a man who owned land could vote several times. He yes. could vote on several islands, yes. for that matter. Yes. But um, the, is getting back to that, we were simply trying to work with the leadership of the Ministry of Education, it was the Department of Education, to do some things that were sensible for education, such as treat teachers with enough respect that if you were going to transfer them, you notify them in advance so they could make arrangements. Uh, they would call you at a school and say, report to so-and-so tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, ridiculous. Anyway. Eventually, that turned out to become seen as a political institution and that it was going to ensure that, that first of all, the PLP become the elected representatives and so on. And so we were thrown into that mold by them. But the way they behaved caused us to accept it and, and work with it. Amen. So we were thought to be political long ago, but I didn't do anything outlandish. Yes, I know. And I didn't speak from any platforms which was against the law. I, I know. Um, the former, former present Governor General said you, you would have been the one who instituted a, a demonstration at the College of Teachers. He did? Yes. That, that's between wow. me and you. Don't tell nobody. We're going to take a station break. When we come back, final wow. segment of Direct Talk. I'm your host, David G. <laughs> We're talking about From Roses to Mount William today <coughs> with Dame Ivy Dumont. Hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver, which is the organ responsible for filtering toxins from the body, producing bile for digestion, and producing proteins and clotting factors. The most important cause of hepatitis worldwide is viruses, of which there are five main types, A, B, C, D, and E. Hepatitis B and C are major health challenges globally, affecting over 300 million persons worldwide. 
The suspicion of hepatitis may be a challenge as there are typically no symptoms. However, if infected, non-specific symptoms may include decreased appetite, nausea, vague abdominal discomfort, jaundice or yellow eyes, and abnormal liver function tests. If not treated, hepatitis of any type can lead to cirrhosis and liver cancer, which leads to over 1 million deaths worldwide. If you suspect you may have been exposed to the virus that causes hepatitis, talk to your doctor today and get tested. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Public Hospitals Authority in conjunction with the Medical Association of the Bahamas and the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. Did you know that if a fire starts in your home, you may have as little as two minutes to escape? Keep your family and home safe with these few fire safety preparation and prevention tips. Ensure that your home has broken smoke detectors. They will alert you if there is smoke and fire in your home. Install a smoke detector on every level of your home, inside each bedroom and outside each sleeping area. Test smoke detectors every month and change the batteries every six months. Home fires can spread rapidly and every second counts. Create an escape plan and practice it with everyone in your home. Make sure everyone can safely escape in less than two minutes. Keep escape routes as clutter-free as possible so no one trips or falls on the way out during an emergency. In addition to smoke detectors, fire extinguishers is an important device to have on hand. To use a fire extinguisher, remember the acronym PASS. Pull the pin, aim the nozzle, squeeze the handle, and sweep from side to side at the base of the fire. We must all do our parts to ensure that our families and homes are safe in the event a fire occurs. On behalf of the Commissioner of Police, the Director of Fire Services, and all officers of the Fire Department, let's work together to help prevent fires, because fire safety is everyone's responsibility, and the life you save may be your own. Welcome the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge on this, their first visit to the country. Our coverage starts Thursday, March 24th at 4 p.m. and continues through their departure Saturday, March 26th. The ZNS Network, your home for the royal visit, William and Kate. Direct Talk. I'm your host, David G. Don't forget to join us tomorrow. We're going to be celebrating Glaucoma Awareness Week uh, along with the Royal Family. Talk to Sir Mike Checkley. Um, Freeport, uh, remembering the Sea Safe Lanes. Uh, next week, Monday, the life of the late Tony Seymour. Talk Cat Island again, the cultural mm -hmm. capital Scott, of the country. Um, some wonderful people have come from Long Island. Um, some great government officials, former two governor general. I, are you and Zorval to Inquest related? He's a to Inquest? Yes. Well, then we are. As a matter of fact, you said during the break that uh, when you got to D government high, they called you to Inquest too. I had to be because he was to Inquest one. <laughs> But I got to be turn quest one after he left because he was <laughs> older than me. And when my brothers came, they were turn quest two and turn quest three and so on, and my cousins. Yeah. But yeah, that that went on. I don't know when it stopped. Maybe when we got um, when we moved out and the school changed to a general school. Yeah. Okay. During the break, we were talking about you being involved with um, this union, this teachers union. Yes, I got off on that because. You'd ask me about meeting a certain person in the um, political area. Yes. And I just wanted to say that a part of how we got there was because we went through this stage of unionism. And um, I, I mentioned to you an experience we had with Carlton Francis, who was an educated gentleman, gentleman, and the then head of the education department. He was the, uh, his name was C.W.F. Bethel. They were liquor, he was a part of liquor merchants. He was the chairman of the board of education. And the union uh, with Mr. Francis and Lead had made appointment to see the board chairman at the office at 10 o'clock of the morning. We all went up and the board chairman was not there. So we thought, wow, we're going to go down to his office and surprise him. We went to his office only to find out that he'd gone on a shooting trip to Andros. 
<laughs> now, if you talk about being angry, that was being angry. And so there was no longer any question about whether we supported any part of the political agenda that was going on. And the right agenda to support was the BLP. Yes. And I recall once after the FNM was the government, somebody said in Janet Boswick's presence, um, Dame Janet, um, I never was a BLP. And Janet said, you should be ashamed of yourself. Yeah. Um, we were all PLPs. Now, why we were no longer so is a different matter, but yes. I won't even th think about getting into that. But asking about go being invited to do something with a political party, I was asked to run for election. I said, no, I'm not willing to do that. I was working at a bank. It was an international company, and I didn't want to be seen as having any particular leanings publicly. I said, but I would help with the administration um, if that was something I could do. Well, that was accepted. And the then Mr. Hubert Ingram fooled me by saying it was a part-time job. He's done that about three times in my life. <laughs> it was a part-time job because there was not a lot of work to do. Well, of course, when you get into a position like that, you have to, first of all, set up some systems, um, prepare some records, do some rules, and all this sort of thing. So I found that I was in a f rather a full-time job. But simultaneously, my office had asked me to stay on. I wanted to retire at the age of 60, which was in October. Uh, and I was, they'd asked me to stay on to finish some work I was doing to um, bring their various uh, companies into alignment because we were in several countries of the world right. and I agreed to do that so I didn't leave until March but in that interim between October and March we agreed that I would go to work a little early so that I could leave a little early so I could go to headquarters but at the time I told Mr. Ingram that I was not going to be involved directly well of course I was <laughs> Um, you know, work with him and not be involved oh, directly, you as you well know. And so I set up meetings, attended meetings, was frustrated at meetings, appreciated him at meetings. He's the only person I know who could listen to people talk a pile of... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. No, that was a natural call. Okay. I, uh, no, sorry. Um, I, he could listen to people present various and sundry points of view and ideas, then he summarizes the whole thing and comes with something that is sensible that I didn't hear anybody say. I never, I never got used to that. But he did it. And so he was able to make sense out of small talk that I thought was nonsense. But anyway, here we are. And so I agreed to do that. Then we were on to election time. 92. 92. And so you know the story of that, so I don't have to even talk about it. Yeah, you... But in 92... I was home in my house minding my own business, having told him that that was the end of my working life when the election was over. I said, I'm going to crawl in my comfortable chair, and the only thing I will do after this is read modern romantics and true story, okay. if anybody knows what they mean. And then I got a call from Brent Simonet saying, we won. And I went out to my husband, who was in the living room with Selzina Coakley. They were taking down the, the results. The results. The and I said, let's go. We have to go to headquarters. So I said, why? Well, I mean, the people say it. Don't. And I said, let's go. So off we went. Of course, then the rain came down and wet, wet us all. We danced in the rain, soaking wet. And then two days later, he and Mr. Bar Barnett came to my house and said, um, he would like me to help with something else they were preparing. Then Andrew came, and he was off to the island um, inspecting what had happened. And that Sunday afternoon, I got a call, said, I heard cabinet office. So I said, Etta, let's go down to cabinet office and see what's going on. Well, when we got there, we met other people there, workers as well as Janet again was there. I had no idea what he wanted, and he got me into this little room. I always got me Ms. Dumont. He said, Ms. Dumont, I want you to be the Minister of Health. And I almost fell off the chair because I, I not only I didn't understand Minister of Health meant, but that he would ask. Yes. 
and I, uh, after a time, well, you know him, so I don't have to describe what went on next. And I said, okay. <clears throat> so I went out, Ed was driving. I didn't tell her, and I didn't tell my husband or my son when I got home. And then I remembered. I said, next morning on the broadcast, he's going to announce the <laughs> ministers and my name will be. So I had to tell them. And when listening to the broadcast the next morning, I heard that I was the Minister of Health and Environment. I was also the leader of the government business in the Senate. Well, I had no idea what the leader of government business in the Senate was. <laughs> But there I was, committed again, fight for many years. But it all turned out well in the end. To God be the glory. So you want me to finish that off? Yes. Well, at the end of that, I said, now I'm really retiring. I had gone then from health to education, which was a wonderful experience for me. That's a different story. And I said, <clears throat> I'm going home. He prom I said, I promise you two years. But after two years, he was going to be writing his cabinet. So he righted it with me in it. And so I was there for another, whatever, six years or so. So now I'm going for good. He said, Mr. Wan, I want you to do one more thing for me. Could you be a head of the cha uh, chairman of the Public Service Commission? He said, it's really a part-time job. You could go in when you want and leave when you like. Well. What that turned out to be was a full-time job uh, from morning till night and in between. And while I was still there, he had one more thing I want you to do for me. Could you act for Sir Orville while he goes to England? And so on. So I said, yo, act for Sir Orville. Act for Sir Orville, that means going to government house. Well, I did that. And then, of course, at the end, I spent several years, four years there as the Governor General. That's the whole story. It's a wonderful story. <clears throat> um, a story only a Long Island lady like you could tell from Roses <laughs> to Montfort's William. You wrote a wonderful book. Thank you very much. I wrote that from notes that I had kept over many years and with a lot of help from a lot of people. My journey has been pleasant and it, most of the time it's been wonderful because I had so, so many wonderful people working to help me to do the things that I did. I had three of the best permanent secretaries in the country. Um, Mr. Major, who became secretary to the cabinet. Wendell Major. Wendell Major. Yes. I had... Um, Mrs. Oh dear. Anyhow, she was. How can I forget her name? Is anyway. Willamay? No, Willamay was third. Okay. Uh, is a lady? Yes. It'll come, it'll come to us. All right. Uh -huh. um, she's going to have my head. No, but she's... anyway, um, she is. Uh, she's Susan's cousin from Grandma Arma. Oh, um, short lady? Yeah. Uh, short lady. He called him a short lady. I, She's not going to hide like that. That's all right. But anyway, she, Hilton, she, was a Hilton, uh, she was Mrs. Hilton, and then she got married again. She was in the cabinet office at one time, too? Yes, okay. I'm sure. Okay. They, these are people. Anita Bernard. Anita Bernard. Yeah. Yes. I'm saying Hilton, Anita <laughs> Bernard. Uh, they, they were three PSs that really made me look good. When I was teaching, I had teachers who also made me look really good. So, you know, I, it's alleged that I did so many things, but it was not that I did them. Other people did the work, but I was there to encourage them and to help them and maybe to listen to them while they did their work. I had people at the other levels who all of you would know, um, my deep, uh, um, DPSs, I had um, education officers, you, you know Mrs. Garraway, and you know Iris Pinder was the director at one point, Zell Medina has passed away now, she was there. They all had ideas for improving this system, and um, I was just so blessed the whole time. And I know that I also had people praying for me, because only God could have taken me through all those things that I experienced over all these many years. Through it all, you've learned to trust in him. You well, I did before. You I did before I entered into any Amen. of these. Where, where do you worship now? I worship at Emmanuel Gospel Chapel. When I, but these days, they don't let me go to church anymore because... Uh, the grandchildren are protecting you. 
They can get you. Oh, I have a granddaughter who's in charge of me. I know. You uh, know? I called her. Uh, when I called you to come on the show, you said, I got to talk to your granddaughter. I say, somebody is taking a <laughs> Well, actually, there are two of them in the house, but the older one thinks she really is in charge. And these two names. And she two gets names. permission. She gets permission from my daughter. I guess if there's anything extraordinary she needs to do. Who are these two beautiful granddaughters? I know one is in studio with us today. One is Deidre, uh -huh. and the other one is Jahan. J I H A N. And these Chetty's girls. These Chetty's girls. Uh -huh. Wow. And they. Somebody's applauding behind yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. They're enjoying the show. <laughs> uh, and I'm told, I'm told by people who do the training uh -huh. that the older one, the one is in the studio, uh -huh. that she's the boss lady. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I realize that. You realize that, yeah. okay. I, I just love how she just got you ready for the show today. Took off your mask and said, I gotta put some lipstick on you. I say, <laughs> if your husband was around, he would think he's getting you ready for another date. <laughs> Presently 90 years old? I am 90 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm 91. 91 years old. I'll be 92 in October. Looking back over your 91 year journey, any regrets? None that come to mind. I have had a wonderful, wonderful life. I had a great husband. I had two wonderful children, both of whom believe in my Lord. So what else could I ask? And then the children, grandchildren that I have, as you, as you know, uh, are just, um, they're just like they had been my children by birth rather than as another level. My daughter-in-law is special. She's the best cook in the world. Mm -hmm. um, one of her daughters is a good cook too. I'm not gonna say which one. <coughs> one the other one is like me. You do what you have to do and you leave the rest to other people. How did your days and roses prepare you for Mount Fifth William? And roses? I don't know that the days and roses prepared me for anything except that I used to snatch my mother's um, sewing needles and so on and try to make clothes. You know, I started sewing very early, I'm told, and then uh, I suppose the only thing that I could think of in roses was that I went to school. That, that would have you know, yeah. prepared you. Yeah. And you are one of at least four GGs with roots in Long Island. What is it about Long Island that helps to produce such outstanding national leaders? Oh, well, that's a big question you're asking. I don't know the answer to it, but I would think that some contribution is that we've been brought up to believe that very, uh, we are very useful and important people. We've been brought up to work. Um, we've never been taught to hold ourselves as, as second-class citizens, you know that. Um, my dad used to always say, hold, hold your uh, um, shoulders back. You don't lean and groan and moan and carry on. You just do what you have to do. We were always independent. We could feed ourselves. Um, we either had farms or we went fishing. Um, I, I, I don't know what else we did, but, but I think that on the whole, we had an independent streak that we could manage by ourselves. And I think that was borne out for me when I had to deal with one of the chairman of the boards of education, I mean, he was talking to me, he asked me to come to his office and I thought he was going to have something to talk about with me. He wanted to talk about my brother who was also a teacher. <laughs> well, if he could be a teacher, well, surely he could talk to him himself, right? <laughs> Amen. And um, so I said to him, you know, I teach for uh, uh, it's a hobby. I work, for, I sew for a living. I, I used, used to take in sewing, yeah. And you still enjoy sewing? I still enjoy sewing. I make, have made about maybe 2,000 masks since the, since the um, coronavirus began. Practically all of my, not maybe all of my relatives and friends have, my, have masks that I've made. Ooh. And my granddaughters, now that they're wearing the ready-made ones and she wants to look pretty, She'll put on the other one on top of it. And so then, and then she puts on this one over, over, over the ready made one. I love it. Right. And it ma it matches your dress. Oh, your, it matches your your, um, your 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 skirt, your your yeah. blouse this morning, today. So that that's what I've been doing and I, I made loads of masks over time. Ever imagine you would have reached 
the high office in the land of Governor General as a child growing up? No, that never. Actually, it used to be just governor, you remember? And when okay. the governor came to the island, maybe once in my lifetime, that was a big deal. You had to treat it like Empire Day with um, standing on the line and waving the flag and all this sort of stuff. Singing and saying, anthem. rule Britannia, Britannia, <laughs> rule the race. <laughs> Britons never will be slaves. You remember that? Yes. And, and God save our God gracious queen. God save our queen. gracious queen. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. um, no, it wasn't something that I think anyone at my, of my um, experience could have ex aspired to because it was, it was not known then, uh, I suspect, that we would ever be an independent country or that we were a country. We were islands. We were called out islands, remember now? Out islands in the colony. Now, New Providence was the island and yes. then the rest of us were the out islands. islands. Ah, so we only got to be family islands much later. Amen. Isn't that something? Last question. As a former teacher, what advice would you have for teachers of today? Well, first of all, I would suggest that anybody who is going to teach and anybody who's teaching, keep abreast of educational developments. Be educated yourself. And by being educated, you know, I have a little um, disc that I teach for that. Being educated does not mean being, having good schooling. I usually, when I'm teaching this, I don't tell people to draw a circle, develop, uh, divide it into, into sections. Your first section is schooling. That's when you're in, under the control of teachers and so on. The next one is training. People have to have training to do what they do. Another one is experience. Experience is a big teacher. And the big one to me is attitudes. So you could have good schooling, you could have good training, you could have work experience, but if you have a bad attitude, you're not useful, in my view. And I think this is what makes the difference in teaching or in any other trade. Because then when you come to think of it, teaching is a trade, yes. something you learn to do, yes. and there are certain, certain um, protocols in, in getting the job done properly. But if people would realize, young people would be taught um, I, I don't mind anybody using my system. I've done it for people over tr in training in many years. Keep in mind that schooling is just one small part of your life. S decide what you want to get some training. I found my most favorite quoting as a child growing up. What did you find? It says, Monday's child. <laughs> is that right? Tuesday's child. Monday. See, Monday's child is fair, fair face. face. Tuesday's child is full of, is grace. Full of grace. Wednesday's, Wednesday's child, child is full of woe. Thursday's, Thursday's child, child has far to go. Friday's, Friday's child, child is loving and giving. Saturday's child, child works hard for a living. But the child that is born on the Sabbath is, is fair, fair and lovely, good and, and gay. Good and gay. <laughs> I wasn't born on the Sabbath, though. I was born on the far to go day. Yeah, I realize that. <laughs> um, uh, and you, you, you started your book with that. Yes. That you are uh, a child that has, a Thursday child That's that right. has far to go. I want to salute you for the wonderful life and the contribution you've made to the building of this country and the lives you've impacted of the generations unborn. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate your salute and I thank you very much. And I am pleased that eventually I was able to capitulate to your harassment yes. to come on this show. And this is Thank excellent. you so much. Excellent work. Thank in the you. Writing Thank of you very book. much. We got to encourage. And like, we can't end the show unless we remember Miles Monroe. Who Miles Monroe you? was the person, every time I met, wherever it was, no matter what the circumstances, Miles said, are you writing yet? You writing yet? <laughs> I said, Miles, you could write the books. I have, But put it here, he said, you know, the best of our history is in the graveyard. Amen. Amen. Always. Uh, and may his soul rest in peace and Amen. rise in glory. This is show today. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks to my producer, Portia Fernanda, uh, Cindy Smith, Master Control today. We had upstairs Angela Riley and Cheryl Clare. Tomorrow, join us. We're going to be right here as we talk about the eyes.
Tomorrow, we're going to be celebrating Glaucoma Awareness Week and the Royal Visit. You've been tuning to Direct Talk. I'm your host, David G. You're listening to the program. By giving unconditionally, not expecting anything in return, I thought it was a wonderful way of showing this love. And I believe that it is love that truly draws people. And so I thought we could cover uh, a lot more people by feeding. Volunteers, you know, they have truly been so. My passion is to help, and I thank God for what I can do through the help of a homeless feeding network. Influenza, or the flu as it is commonly called, is a viral illness that usually occurs between the months October to March. The virus is transmitted from person to person through coughing, sneezing, or talking. Symptoms include fever, cough, headache, runny nose, generalized body aches, and fatigue. There is no specific treatment for the flu, and the symptoms usually dissipate after three to seven days. Because it is caused by a virus, antibiotics are not used to treat the flu. Persons are encouraged to rest and drink lots of fluids. Panadol is recommended for fever and body aches associated with the flu. However, aspirin should be avoided due to the risk of bleeding. To decrease the spread of flu, persons are encouraged to get their flu shot annually and practice good cough hygiene. Additional information can be provided by your community clinic or the Health Education Division at the Ministry of Health. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health in partnership with the Public Hospitals Authority. You're watching the ZNS Network. The People Station.